Thank you all for being here. Thank you, The Aster and Sabina and the entire Rebuild team for having us. Are you ready? You want to just I'm get ready. into it? Boom, let's get into it. OK. Thank so, you, guys. Thanks for coming. I'm like, one more time for a minute. No. no. <laughs> so last time I saw you in New York, we were talking about the divine. We were talking about God. We were talking about what it means to kneel at the altar every day even if God is quiet that day. And in re-listening to the seventh hand in preparation for our conversation, it stunned me how each movement kind of leads you into a deeper place of surrender, both as the listener, but I also imagine as the person, of course, who created the work. And I wonder if we can start by thinking about the album structure, if you can describe to us kind of how we get all the way to lift, this kind of final exalted moment of improvisation, and how yeah. that kind of relates to this act of kneeling at the altar every day. Yeah, so um, I guess to, to start, uh, I got the idea to write, the, to write this, it's a suite of seven pieces. I got the idea from um, playing in church. I was like uh, playing piano in church and seeing people you know, get filled with the Holy Spirit, catch the Holy Spirit shouting all that and uh looking around and being like man i don't do that you know what you know well how does that manifest itself through me and so i was like okay well maybe like maybe this is something that i can access through the music you know and i had always had uh i'd always had experiences like playing where um you get to a certain place in the music where you feel like you're not the one making the music you know um and so i was like okay well maybe that this is like this is my manifestation of catching the Holy Spirit or what it means for just spirit possession in general. You know, all, all of, um, I feel like all of maybe African diasporic spiritual practices have some sort of spirit possession involved in the, in the practice. And so I figured, well, maybe I can write kind of a, uh, a suite that would generate it almost for me. You know, I think something that's like special about maybe the black church or just, you know, black spirituality in general is that um, it kind of happens upon you. It's not something that you even decide to partake in. It kind of like, like arrive at the thing. Boom. Yeah. And so um, I was like, well, maybe I could like make something that does it too. Like if by just playing it, you like it takes you, the, you know, what I mean, it's kind of like a conveyor belt sort of rigorous process that it happens to you at the end. So. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote seven pieces. Uh, this is also one of the first times where I had, um, I had the idea before I had the music, which is harder for me than to have the music and then have the idea. Like theorizing and then making versus making then theorizing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it was a whole lot of concept without any music. You know, and it's, it's, it's also kind of like a daunting process. And, and I, I like to talk of it more of an idea than an actual like thing that works, just because I, sometimes I'm not sure if it works. You know, the the process itself. You know, I don't know. And also, I like I think that's a lot to even put on me. Like going into the process of writing, and I was like, man, how am I supposed to write something that just oh, you so we just leaving room for for Jesus to come down? You know, it's yeah. like this is not gonna happen. <laughs> you know, so. Um, I think it was more of like, okay, well, what happened? Like, can we invest, you know, it, there's, more, there's, there's more strength in the idea than the actual practice itself, maybe. Um, and that kind of pursuit that we were talking about, that thing of like visiting the altar every day, um, especially like right now we're on tour, so we're playing it every night. Um, yes, sometimes it, it feels different than other nights, you know. Another thing that has struck me profoundly about the way you talk about your own practice is becoming a vessel, but not only by yourself, also in tandem with the other members of your quartet. And I wonder if you could kind of muse a little bit about what vesselhood means for you, um, and then we can depart in another direction. Yep. Um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of that same thing. I, um, you know, um, I think part of that feeling of like being in those like intense moments where we don't feel like the ones making the music. There's some sort of like zooming out, out of body thing where you're kind of like watching yourself do the thing. You become kind of a witness mm -hmm. to the work being done 
on the bandstand, you know? Um, and so for me, that was kind of that vessel, you know, like that's what kind of becoming a vessel was to me. Um, mm -hmm. Also, uh, I guess my band had been playing together for five years at the point of me writing the music, now seven years. And um, yeah, I think, I mean, they were around when I was writing it in the house. I, my, my drummer, Kwaku, was back there. Woohoo, woohoo. Woo he, so we lived together for three years, um, and uh, so I mean he was very much around. My, my piano player was crashing on my couch at the time. They had a kind of real experience with even learning the music and, and even working on the music with me. You know, I, even in my compositional process, I send them like little two-bar voice memos and like, okay, this is what it's about to be. Now here's four bars. Here's six bars. Here's ten bars. So, I mean, I, I think in, in that way, like. They're not active composers in the process. I mean, they could be. Um, and may maybe in the moment they are. But um, I think, yeah, like when I'm writing it, they're, they're very much a part of that. So that becomes a part of that vessel thing as well as, you know, we're all kind of vulnerable and comfortable with each other to even open up to that happening. Because it takes a certain amount of trust for any musician to even partake in that process with somebody, you know? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I love that, thank you. I wonder if we could also spend a moment with the significance of the number seven in the album and kind of the biblical reference of the number six being kind of like the furthest extent of human possibility. Mm -hmm. And then we have this kind of, this seventh hand. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I just, I, I thought about like the laying of hands, you know, um, and the, the symbol of hands in, in the black church, in, in, in black sex in general, um, maybe the, you know, the, the uh, I guess the polarity of like lifting hands in praise and lifting hands in surrender mm -hmm. to God or lifting hands, you know, um, in front of the police, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so uh, yeah, I, th I thought that hands were, were something that um, were maybe important uh, and, and kind of an important way of me even talking about that sort of moment of becoming a vessel. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, I think just the seventh, seventh hand just felt like a it felt like a vibe, it felt like a vibe title. I was like, man, this mm -hmm. is this is hard, you know. We, it is. you know, <laughs> some people, um, some some jazz musicians call it. Uh, they say you get into the big room when you start playing free. They're like, oh man, you play in the big room, mm -hmm. you know. And so I was like, I was like, man, what's my version of the big room? What's the big house? Mm -hmm. Where, like, what does it mean to play in the big house? That's like, I'm like, oh yeah, we we tapping into the seventh hand. That's like, we, yeah, you know. That's, can I quote you to yourself? Uh oh. So you were talking about um, the song Lift, the final movement. Mm -hmm. And you said that to an outsider, it's gibberish or meaningless. But those tongues said codes to the creator. To the slave owner, Aunt Hester's screams were just screams. But to the other slaves, those screams carried messages to flee, to sing, to run, to keep working, a host of things. Um, and it feels like with Lyft in particular, you're kind of practicing and embodying this sense of black sonic fugitivity is like the phrase that I kept coming to as I was preparing. Um, and I also read that you're kind of thinking about the making of your music as a way of imagining other possibilities, um, specifically possibilities that create space for the thriving of black life. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to that sense of black sonic fugitivity and like what is it that you're getting at? What is it that each movement is moving towards or perhaps away from? Yeah, yeah, um, you know, um, I, I was just talking to somebody the other day about uh, kind of uh, black music as being subversive, mm -hmm. you know, um, and not only, you know, I guess, so Lyft is, is free, it's like completely improvised, it's atonal in a lot of ways, um, some would call it avant-garde jazz music, you know? Um, and I think that um, even, like, I, man, if you look through, throughout the whole tradition of jazz music, it, it's always been, like, each, each, like, 10 years, there's always a kind of a new movement era in the music, and they were all pretty much based out of kind of fugitivity and, and, and escape and trying to, like, shake folk off their back, you know? Um, 
you hear about like Charlie Parker and Dizzy talking about making bebop, and uh, they mentioned like, man, we're just trying to like shake white folk off our back. We just don't want people, you know, they start being able to play, play our shit. So like, mm-hmm. let's, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, I, I was thinking about that. And then also I was thinking about that kind of idea of like deeply coded material, stuff that um, maybe only resonates to us. I, I was even thinking of like um, black preachers hooping, you know, um, and I, I remember I remember one of my first experiences going to church as a young person and leaning over to my mother. Why why is the pastor screaming? You know what I mean? And so, so like that's that sort of thing. I um, I think I was uh, I, I think that's like it's coded material for me now. It, it, I understand you know I understand what that means. You know, and, um, yeah. I don't. So I I I love the idea of the avant garde as as kind of this visceral like. Um, representation of, of just like real black codes, you know, um, yeah. Absolutely. Another thing that kind of kept coming up, I think when we spoke, but also in reading about what other people have said about your work is folks don't know where to place you. Um, and people are speaking about how kind of with the flick of a wrist, you're switching between genres kind of seamlessly. And I feel like that's also a part of fugitivity is like finding a way to evade categories which, I mean, across history, black people have been punished for in a whole host of ways for a whole host of reasons, but I wonder if that's kind of an active thing that you think about as you're making the work, or if it's something that kind of just comes about, this notion of like encryption and keeping people on their toes. Hmm. Um, hmm. No, I don't really, I, I don't know if I really think about that, but I do, um, hmm. I think of it after the fact. You know, I, I, it's it's hard to like. I mean, it's funny with any sort of people who make artistic output. Mm-hmm. Um, we're often in like a weird gray area of like critiquing ourselves and also trying to be in the moment. Mm-hmm. And um, it's like I, I come to those realizations after the fact. Mm-hmm. You know, I, but when I'm making. I can't mm-hmm. think about the critique almost. Yeah. You know, I, I'm gonna make bad. I'm gonna make absolutely. bad stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know. Um, so so yeah. I mean, there's that. But then, uh, yeah, I, I do think about fugitivity often, as especially as it pertains to the seventh hand. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's the third part of the the third part of the suite is like. Um, Loosely based around the, the black church and how um, it's kind of just like a place that is not necessarily, uh, you know, segregated. It's not. It's not like white people aren't welcome in, in the black church, but, but they don't come. But somehow it's all <laughs> black people in there, you know. And so I was thinking about, um, you know, that is kind of a fugitive space of. of just refuge or, or peace, you know, and, and how many of these spaces do we, have? you know, like the, man, the block is like that, you know, you go to the corner, the corner's like that, you know, um, yeah, so I, I definitely, I think that, like, that es- escape is, is something that I'm always kind of coming back to, subversion, um, yeah, all of that. I also feel like in listening to the suite, my sense is that you're someone who has an active reading practice. Yeah. And I'm curious about the ways that that kind of textual study and studying literature kind of transfers into the way that you make your music. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, man, it, it all kind of relates to the music. I, I try to put as much into the music as possible. Mm-hmm. In this, um, yeah, in this case, it, there's a lot of texts. Mm-hmm. Fred Moten, mm-hmm. Sadia Harmon. Tell like, us about Fred Moten. Yeah, you know what I mean? Those are the two, like, where it's like, okay, I'm clearly mm-hmm. referencing Stealing material, you know, <laughs> completely <laughs> stealing material. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think that's, you know, I, I often tell musicians, like, that's probably the only, that's, or that's like one of the ways that um, folk can really just be individual as, as even musicians is, man, you gotta, you gotta deal with the extra musical. Mm-hmm. You gotta, it's, man, this thing ain't only about music, you know? Um, and so, yeah, because I mean, look, we all check out the same records. You know, every musician is listening to Dexter Gordon, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Mary Lou Williams, Alice Coltrane, McCoy Tyner. Everybody's listening to the same people. So 
in essence, like why don't we come out sounding the same? It's, mm -hmm. you know, so I mean, I, I think often I'm, I'm just leaning on as, as much other stuff. Also, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not really uh, interested in just making songs. I'm not interested in just writing tunes, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, I, 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 wanna, I wanna do something bigger with that, than that. And um, man, uh, you know, another thing, that, and this, this may sound dramatic, but you know, I write music to kind of fill a void, or I do any, you know, I, I play music to fill a void that I see, you know? And maybe if I didn't see a void, then maybe I wouldn't play, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe I wouldn't write mm -hmm. if I if if I if I didn't have things I wanted to hear on my phone, or there wasn't like mm -hmm. I didn't see that people were in need, mm -hmm. you know, or need food, or like mm -hmm. need, you know. Uh, so I, I think I'm always trying to use my my practice as a way to give space for that to happen, you Absolutely. know. Um, yeah, and and yeah, that's where the uniqueness comes comes in cuz I'm not like I'm not actively like I mean maybe I'm coming up with new ideas but I don't I don't know once again the quote Dizzy Gillespie Dizzy was like they were like yo so like um you know I, did you know you were going to change music when you started playing bebop and he was like no I was just trying to play good mm -hmm. and I totally resonate with that I'm just like musically I'm just trying to play good mm -hmm. the different stuff is like okay well how can I use my music without the you know or like in tandem with something else. Absolutely, you know? yes. Another thing that I have not stopped thinking about since we last saw each other was the note you made about the distinct difference between European musicians and American musicians. And like yeah. this sense of kind of precarity that we deal with in the US that of course is grappled with in Europe but on different terms. And mm -hmm. I wonder what that relationship is for you between essentially like living in these pockets of agony and producing something that is kinetic and forceful and can move people like that. Totally. So um, I'm I'm just gonna give I'm gonna mm -hmm. give them this, the same spiel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was uh, I was in Paris and I was um, over this cat's house, who's a drummer, who's from Italy, and we went to Juilliard together. Together, and I remember I was I was over his house in Paris, and he was like, "Man, you know, you gotta move to Paris. It's so nice. Artists get a stipend. They get like like two thousand a month if you prove that you live in." In, in, uh, in Paris and you work in Paris, 2,000 a month. And so I was like, damn, that sounds hard. That's a bet, like <laughs> I should move to Paris, right? And then, um, you know, I was thinking about it and I was like, man, but these cats don't, they can't play. They sound limp. They all sound very limp. And I was like, man, I wonder, like I really wonder what the, uh, like what it is. And I was like, man, there's, there's no, but, but New York musicians are like hard. Chicago musicians hard, like New Orleans musicians great, like Detroit. Hard. LA, ah, mm -hmm. you know, LA musicians, ah, they don't really sound that great. Like jazz musicians. And so I was like, oh, man, you know, I wonder if it's something about just the bite of New York, the struggle in New York that actually begats great music, you know, or powerful work. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. And so I, that's, that's what the, the discouraged me from moving to Paris. <laughs> and, and I'm scared of it. I'm really scared of like moving to LA even and, mm -hmm. and being like, chilling out. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too sunny. Mm -hmm. It's just too sunny. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's too sunny out there. And, and, and I love LA. <laughs> Every time I'm there, I'm like, damn, I should move. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's, it, so I, I do think that, um, yeah, being in the trenches, just there's something important about the mm -hmm. trenches. And this, uh, this is something uh, I was talking about was, with, okay, um, my friend, uh, I, we were talking about, um, he loves like Papa John's, Little Caesar's Pizza, like Popeyes, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, and he was like, oh man, you know, you like that bougie shit, you know, man, you be going like Michelin star, <laughs> Mr. Michelin. And I'm like, all right, cool, man. But you know, I, and I told him, I was like, man, I'm a connoisseur of the high and the low. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You gotta have the high and the low. Um, and then we started talking about, man, the, some of the most like deepest spiritual healers in the world get deep in the trenches. They get mm -hmm. down and dirty. Mm -hmm. Like you'll be surprised what they do, mm -hmm. you know? like prostitution, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, and not to, not, not saying that sex work is negative, but you know, like, what I mean is like, they, uh, like they get down in the, in the like, trenches with mm -hmm. folk, they in the hood, they hanging in the hood with the, mm -hmm. with the regular people, they say that like, Jesus hung with like the, you know, with, with the criminals, with, mm -hmm. with, you know, people who were, you know, killing people, murderers, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, I think that, 
yeah, I don't know, man. I, I think there's something deeply spiritual about that place, mm -hmm. you know, being, being like, being from the hood, mm -hmm. you know, be, hanging, like, hanging with the lay people, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not, the up there, there's, I don't know, I don't know what's up there, mm -hmm. you know, but, so I, I think about that high-low thing often as mm -hmm. well, you know, it's like, there's something about the trenches that is really like, mm -hmm. where, where we, like, where we need to be for, for a period, mm -hmm. you know. I feel like there's also something about like the density of experience yeah. that you're describing totally. that I think is exactly what creates electrifying work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on the note of just kind of geographical differences, I feel like a place like LA or Paris even, like time moves differently there. Mm -hmm. If you're in New York, like there's a sense of like you're just on this forever treadmill. And that's yeah. not been my sense when I'm in Europe either. And it reminds me of another thing you had mentioned about the way that performance and also composing alters and skews your perception of time. Mm, yeah. And I think we also know at this point that like black people are existing on a different quantum field, like time mm -hmm. exists for us differently. Like yes, Lakeshore Drive was closed, but also colored people time is a real thing. Definitely. And I wonder if you could speak to just a little more specifically even about how the act of performance and embodying this vesselhood alters time for you. Boom. Um, yeah, okay, so a another, another of my things that I'm gonna go into. So um, I've been interested in like uh, BPMs, right? So if, if, uh, uh, like, uh, if you're playing music, each, each kind of thing is a, you know, each tempo is a certain number of beats per minute, right? So if you have 60 beats per minute, that's regular clock time, right? Um, the songs can be wherever, 320 beats per minute, like super fast, or, or you know, 120 beats per minute. I'm, I'm not perfect with my metronome, but I think this is about 120 beats per minute. But you know, I, you know and I was thinking about like how maybe certain uh, concerts feel faster or shorter. Um, and then I was like, man, you know, I wonder if just music naturally just e exists outside of the realm of temporality in general. Um, and uh, yeah, I th maybe, maybe that's like our escape. That's why music feels like a portal, you know? Um, it's because you're offering us another mode of time. You're often a new, offering a new thing up. Yeah, if, we, if you're living in, I don't know, 120 beats per minute for 15 minutes, then that time feels shorter or faster than, than, than 60, you know? I also, as an art writer, have to ask you about the collaborations you've been doing with visual artists recently. And I think I read somewhere, maybe you told me this, that you think about lift this final exalted moment in the movements as um, kind of a way of grasping at this nothingness or embodying mm -hmm. this nothingness. And a thread that I was having trouble just untangling for myself is what it means for you to be responding to visual artworks that take up space, that have mass, that have presence. Like it's kind of the antithesis of nothingness. Mm -hmm. It's a thing in the world. Yeah. And I'm curious about how maybe that process is perhaps different than the process of composing your own music. Uh, wow, yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know if, I, if I'm grasping your qu question correctly, but... I can rephrase. It's cool, it's cool. <laughs> um, I wonder if uh, like that nothingness that I'm thinking of is um, inside the body, it's not about, it's, Yes, yeah, it's, it's more inside than outside, you know? Um, it's kind of like a, uh, a breaking of within, you know? Um, the same, maybe the same notions of like meditation mm -hmm. or meditative practices um, where maybe, maybe I'm not thinking about anything. Just like mm -hmm. even in my conversation right now, there's no kind of preconceived, mm -hmm. you know? Um, to be in that place is, is uh, that Zen place is kind of optimal for even cre creating whatever, making things. You know, you almost have to like have be a be a vessel or be a void mm -hmm. of some sorts um, 
It's like dissociating, but in a good way. Yeah, in a good way. Yeah, in order to make something. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud. I don't even know if that's the answer, but um, yeah, I, I wonder. I wonder what what it is. Mm -hmm. You know. We also have a very special guest, Satchel, who actually took the photo on the album cover. Boom, boom. And I wonder if you could speak to the kind of compositional logic behind it. For those who don't, it's a manual in a body of water and hands are being laid. Yeah, so, I, um, you know, I, I remember I, I kind of just, I approached Satchel just about um, doing the cover. I gave her, did I send you some like, did I send you some ideas? Okay. Yeah, we had a conversation, and I mean, it, and it was also like, start like she sent you sent me the set, and it, it was that phone. It was like it was one. It was the one, was it? You know, we knew we knew what it was. I'm pretty sure you knew as you were sending the set. It's like okay, that's gonna be the you know, um, I, yeah, it, it, yeah. It was kind of interesting how that thing happened. Also, I mean, we were talking about the trenches. We were we were at some like random uh, fishermen's pond in, off the Bell Parkway in Queens. Um, we had like feet, uh, fish biting our feet and stuff. It wasn't, um, no, yeah. And it wasn't, it was not, it, we weren't supposed to be in that water, mm -hmm. for sure. It was um, <laughs> dirty water. I got dunked in and I was thinking about it after the fact. I'm like, this is not safe. Like, this is really not safe, you know? Very unsafe, deeply unsafe. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow, um, but yeah, you know, I, and, and I mean, it was we didn't have a permit to do it. I don't, I don't, it was just a very, very fugitive process. <laughs> um, yeah, but and 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 it kind of also just um, kind of was happenstance that there's seven hands visible on the cover. I didn't, we didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. We were just shooting. We were just just making it, making it, making it happen. Um, yeah, yeah, please. Exactly. Please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone described, and my citations are evading me, but someone said that you are exploding grids with your rhythm. And as a deep lover of abstraction, it made me think about the minimalist movement and the grid as kind of this recurring visual idiom that comes up. And it made me also think again of the collaborations you've been doing with artists. And I wonder, um, like I know AJ is someone who deeply influences you. And I wonder if there are other works, other people in the visual arts that you're looking at. Yes, um, Mr. Theaster Gates. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, yeah, I mean, Martin Pierre is a big influence of mine. Mm -hmm. Torquasi Dyson yes. is a huge influence. Um, I mean, man, there's so, so many. Uh, yeah, a AJ is a big one. Colleen Smith is a big one. Um, man, I'm, man let, me, let, me, let me think. Simone Lee is a huge mm -hmm. one, huge one. Um, Terry Atkins. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean the list list goes on, um, and it, it was interesting. Some, somebody asked me like, you know, like how many how many pieces do you have that are like, like inspired by like artworks and stuff, and I really don't have many pieces that are like directly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really work that way for me at all. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I have yeah like, if I'm thinking about my repertoire, I have one song that I've ever written that was about an art piece. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and. Um, yeah, I, I think it's more. It's more about the rap, you know. It's, it's more about the rap, and 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 about just. Once again, those ex, just kind of extra musical um, influences, and yeah, I don't know. It just kind of affects my overall practice. The grids thing, I have nothing to say about. I don't know. Am I exploding grids? I don't know. I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, I, um, I I do think um, I. I do think there's something about um, about maybe improvisational music, creative music that um, does tend to, I don't know, there's something about, what am I even trying to say? There's something about like opening up the, 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 like the music that, remixing the music, um, that's kind of interesting to me. Like, 
there's a recording of John Coltrane playing Naima uh, really late, like 1966. He died in 67. And uh, he's playing Naima, and you don't hear the melody at all. Like, he did the whole, and it's out of time. Um, and I remember I, I, I brought this up uh, to somebody because Appar like apparently I played like a solo piece and I never played the melody or something. I was like, well, Train did it, Train did it on my, um, you know, but I think like there's something about the way that jazz musicians have always kind of remixed material or, um, you know, taken material and, and claimed it as their own, you know, you know, that's, um, I don't know, there's something about that agency I think is really important, you know. Um, like even back in the day with, you know, I mean the culture of jazz musicians taking these show tunes, right? Uh, I mean this, this was like the, the, the big thing back in the day was playing like, you know, All the Things You Are or Summertime or Gershwin songs or Cole Porter songs. And taking these, um, taking these tunes and, and just remix, it was about the solo, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I, that's a critique on, on jazz today. I feel like jazz today is not necessarily about the solo as much as it should be. You know, John Coltrane was trying to get to the solos. Mm -hmm. You know, Thelonious Monk was, he was like, never mind the song, let's get to the solos. Mm -hmm. Bird was like, let's, let's play the solo. Mm -hmm. He didn't even title any of his songs. Bird never titled any of his pieces. All the, all the titles you see that of Charlie Parker songs were done by the folk in the studio, like the producers. Oh, wow. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't title any of his tunes. And you know, I was thinking, I'm like, man, they was just trying to play. They, was just, they were trying to get to the solo, mm -hmm. you know? And I, there's something about that in-between thing that I'm in that I'm really into. Um, yeah, it wasn't about it wasn't about playing these songs, pre preserving the integrity of the tunes, you know. Um, yeah, and in that way, I feel like we've all been exploding grids, you know, everybody for, since the 1920s, you know. I also want to just touch back on something you mentioned earlier about the kind of profound levels of trust that it takes for you to be in that in-between space. Mm -hmm. And just one more time, if you don't have tickets to see the show, please buy a ticket to see the show at 8.30 yeah, at Constellation. Come. Please. It's going to be magical. Right. Um, and I want to hearken back for one more question about yeah. black space. We are, of course, at Stony Island Arts Bank, like the most sanctified space for black art, for black creativity. Yeah. And earlier you referenced the black church as a space that kind of shapes what we might deem as sanctified or yeah. not, mm -hmm. as holy or not. Yeah. And I wonder, this is a very broad question, but kind of about what the phrase or understanding of black space means to you musically, but also maybe just a manual as a manual. Yeah, I mean, man, I, you know, I think um, uh, going back to that kind of uh, thing I was talking about with the church, man, I think black space is, is um, somewhere where, where we can be free, mm -hmm. you know, correct? So, um, you know, when, when I thought about maybe the church as a place like this, I was also thinking of it as a site of these kind of, of the supernatural. Mm. And maybe we can't get to the supernatural thing unless we're escaping some sort of gaze mm -hmm. or perform, performance, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, yeah, bl black space inherently it is supernatural, mm -hmm. but it, it takes a certain uh, escape of surveillance, we, you know? And, you know, ev everyone talks about the John Coltrane Quartet as opening a portal on stage. They're always yeah. like, oh man, they opened up a portal <laughs> on stage. And I'm like, like, man, I wonder if they were thinking about the audience. They mm -hmm. couldn't have been thinking about the audience mm -hmm. in that, you know, that sort of like viewership. You know, often in church, they talk about, um, you know, like, it's not a performance and, and it, like, y'all ain't the audience, y'all are the congregation, mm -hmm. right? My mama always, always would tell me, oh no, you're not performing, it's, ain't no audience, it's the congregation. And, mm -hmm. and there's something about that like, kind of group mm -hmm. participation and it's, it's not this like kind of surveillance mm -hmm. based viewership that I think is really essential to things happening mm -hmm. you know I don't think I don't think shit can happen if it's like you know you up here performing I don't mm -hmm. think performance is what I'm looking for at all mm -hmm. you know and I think that's maybe what uh maybe in essence I'm I'm preoccupied with with concerning black spaces like mm -hmm. anti-performance mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um just kind of togetherness and, and group, group cultivation, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. In the spirit of call and response, would you like to take questions? Boom, yes, please. Y'all got questions? Covered a lot.
talk about the waves and the waves. You, you, don't, you don't seem to have limits. Even if you play a horn, it seems there seems to be something limitless about your curiosity. And if you can talk a little bit more about your adjacency to the rest of life. Yeah, um, so, I, uh, so I started my foray into the visual art realm and, and really in high school, I, I, I first was like really into like Baroque painting of like Vermeer, Rembrandt were like my two go-to cats. <laughs> um, and then in college, uh, we had to take one liberal arts course at Juilliard and I took art history all three years or all four years. Um, so yeah, it was that. And then also, I, you know, and then it was a combination of, of you know, my love, my just natural kind of love for arts. And then um, thinking about like my favorite jazz musicians from back in the day, I was like, man, they, they all were friends with those cats, man. I'm like, man, let me, let me get out here and like, man, all those people I'd be seeing just up on the walls places, let me go meet them. Let me go say hello. Cause man, we're missing out on a big opportunity. And, and there is a divide, there's, a, there's definitely a divide of the scenes, you know, the, the, mu the music world, especially the cre like, like creative alt, alt music world and, and the art world. And I was like, man, no, let, like, let me cross the line here, you know? Um, so I think it was that. And then also, um, yeah, I mean, it, music is fleeting, you know? M music comes and goes and I think maybe I'm, maybe I'm, given away uh, too much too early because it might not happen, but maybe I'm also interested in making things. Maybe I'm interested in like making things that like live a long time, you know? Um, and also maybe figuring out how that can happen with music. Man, often I, I was, um, of, often I've been thinking about spot, man, Spotify, Apple Music, all these things as not really being an uh, effective archive for how we archive our music, you know? And like, what would happen if I built a building and put all my voice memos just up in the wall? You know what I'm saying? What, like, where people could just go listen to the voice memos, you know, or, and it would just stay there, you know? Because I'm, I'm always afraid of that. I'm always afraid of dying today. And then like, man, I got like, I got three or four records worth of music in the, in the holster that will play tonight. You know, like we're gonna, we're gonna play music that we have got. Now if I die today, where's it going? Yeah. It's just done. You know, if someone knows my password, they can get my voice memos, but that's it. You know, and so I'm kind of like, man, I, I, I want the process to be faster. You know, the rollout for a record is like six months. You, it takes like six months to like, you know, do a proper rollout, at least six months, you know, for like a budget joint. You know, so I'm like, man, what if I could just put, you know, before I even put out any records, I was kind of like, what would happen if I put out a record a month or a record of like a week? You know, I'm just like, just throw them out there, you know, but they won't sell that way. I mean, I don't know, maybe they won't, you know, but you know, I'm often thinking about just, just how, how, like, how can I just get it all out, the output? And um, I know I'm kind of going on a tangent, but Maybe like just making physical things is what I'm also interested in, and in, 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 and art does. You know, they it has a life that lives on. You know, I I have a relationship with so many artists, and I don't know them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. So I I think that's kind of where I'm coming from. One word that kept on coming up for me throughout this talk was the idea of presence um, and the way that it relates to temporality. And I was wondering, it's not so much a question maybe, it's just wanting to hear your thoughts on it and the way you talk about kind of being in the flow when you're making something and even how that relates to um, like catching the spirit and the sense of kind of being in the present moment and that mm -hmm. how sometimes that might be in conflict with the way that we consume music or archive it, like you said. So I'm just kind of curious in terms of that balance between like presence and being in the moment versus just the kind of realities of production and being yeah. creative. Man, I, 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 tend to, I tend to put, I tend to put art making first in that, man, when, when I get it, I'm kinda in it for as long as I need to be. Nothing else matters in, in a way. Um, so, yeah, it's totally an escape of temporality fully. You know, when, when you're in the moment, 
it doesn't matter. And, and I even want to get to the point where I'm, man, I remember, so I used to, um, I used to play for, for Ty Tribbett for a little while, for like two years. And I remember, um, I remember being in, in like rehearsals with Ty and he would go, he would go hard. Like it would be like, the, it would be better than the performance, better than the performance. In the performance, it would be kind of a performance. You know, he would move it along as it would. But man, we'd be in rehearsals for like five hours and we'd be playing the same song and just sitting in, in a, in a space for like five hours, like not rehearsing. We're not working on the music. You know, we'd just be kind of sitting there like, he'd be like, oh man, just keep going, just keep, you know, just like in the spirit. And I was like, man, there's, there's a certain like, like he did not care about, it, it was, it, something was moving in the room. And, and I was like, man, like, like if only if I could get like, like get a performance to feel like that. What, what would happen if, if we were on the bandstand and we could like, we had the agency to make the executive decision to just keep going. We're like, man, we can't stop now. Mm -hmm. Or we have to stop now. You know, whichever one. It's like, I think that, that's, that's something that I'm reaching for. I want to get to the point where like, we can really move anywhere. Because mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't cross that line. It's like, if it's an hour set, we, we play an hour set. Mm -hmm. You know, or maybe we go like an hour 15, but we're not going to do like three hours. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we do 45, we're gonna have to talk to some people after, like, hey, look, sorry, we 15 minutes short. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm like, man, like, part of me is like, man, if 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 something's going on, if something's moving. I remember we were in Germany and we played this one tune, uh, and we we played it for for quite literally an hour, just the one song after the set, and nobody stopped us, um, and it, it it felt great, and I but I but I felt anxiety in, in my heart about continuing to stay in the moment yeah. because I'm not used to doing it. I was just like, I was like, yo, man, like we've been playing this one joint for like, and I mean, it was quite literally like a four bar vamp, four bar vamp, and we were playing it for an hour. Mm -hmm. It was, I saw the, I got the voice memos. It was, <laughs> we were on the vamp for 45 minutes, which means the song was about an hour. And I'm like, I'm like, man, this is, this is, this is crazy. But, and I remember being in that moment and being like, oh man, Maybe we should stop. Maybe, maybe I should. Maybe I should go ahead. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, all right, y'all. You know, but um, yeah. So I don't know. I, I think that like I've I've really gotten to a point where it's it's gotten experimental in that way. Where I'm like, I'm like, bro, the, the moments, everything in in my compositional practice when I'm at at the crib and when I'm on the bandstand. It's like if I'm in it, nothing nothing matters. I, I can't really pay attention to anything else. You know. I hope not, because also like that stuff is cherished. Like, it, like the spirit doesn't always fall like that. Yeah. You know, things don't always. You know, it's not always special. Mm -hmm. You know, so when it is, it's, I'll I'll stay there forever if I can. You know, until I lose it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh no, this it's not bringing me fruit anymore. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, boss. Uh, I had a question about, I was thinking about space when you were talking about doing what you do in that space. And then I looked, so this is my first time going to Constellation. I looked on Google, I saw the imagery. I was like, wow, I've never really seen a setup like this. So that got me wondering, like, how important is the design of the space that you, you're operating in with other people? And then, like, the two parts of that is, like, how would you, because I'm going off what you were just talking about, how would you design that space where you could come do what you do, others come operate as well with you, and it would be where you could flow in that space however long, yeah. whatever, you know, wherever you want to take it. How would you design that for a future? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, um, so yeah, yeah that, that makes me think of a lot of things. So the first thing is, I mean, yeah, every space is different and a lot of it is about playing the room. You know, every room kind of vibrates at its own frequency. And so finding, and, and that's like, like literally and figuratively, you know? Um, and so finding what those frequencies are is important. You know, that's, um, that's kind of maybe what the sound check's about, like re truly, you know? it's. I mean, one is about, yeah, you know, can you hear what you need in your monitors? But I don't even use monitors for that reason. I'm kind of like, man, let me just attune my ear to playing the room. You know, what, like, what is the room giving me? Um, it also makes me think of uh, this great um, 
uh, writer and theorist and, and musician, uh, Pauline Oliveros. Um, she came up with this thing called deep listening. Um, so ch she was a cello player, and uh, I think she, she came up with this thing. She was playing in a, in a huge like cistern, right? And uh, it had a reverb time, a reverberation time of like eight seconds or something. So you play a note, and it just stays out there for eight seconds. And um, she was like, man, like, I, I had to quite literally play with the room. The room became its own instrument, you know? Um, and so then, you know, and so she, she like kind of created all these uh, kind of meditative practices on like how to even attune your ears to listening better. Just day-to-day -day life, like w we could do some of these practices now even. It's just um, really uh, cool stuff she came up with. And so it, it makes me think of that, you know. Um, and then, uh, I, you know, I, I've had aspirations of, of making a space, like building a space that conditions people to be able to internalize music better. You know, like, man, what, what would it be like to like, to go, just to go to a concert, go out there for three days, and first two days you don't listen to music. You don't listen to anything. Maybe it's just exercise. Maybe, maybe it's all of Pauline's just exercises on how to like, how to hear, you know? Um, and then, yeah, and, and, and then maybe you hear the concert, you know? Um, but I, I, and as much as it is the space, it's also the people that are occupying the space that me, means so much, you know? Um, yeah, it, like, that, that's, that's why we have good, bigs, good, good gigs and bad gigs. It's not because um, nothing's going our way, you know? I can, I can get over, like, feedback in the monitor or something, but, like, if the audience isn't really, like, there for me, then I, then I can't play well. You know, I can't play well if, if, if the audience isn't like, if they're not there on stage with me. You know, if I can't feel them on stage, then I sound bad, you know? Um, Everybody has Yeah. Has Boom. Exactly. Yep, yeah, that's, that's sort of spontaneity. That's, it's like, man, they're so, like, the black church is spontaneous, which is dope, you know? It, like, preacher will go on for three hours. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's spontaneous, you know? I, I, how can I do that? You know, I'm not saying I'm trying to hold y'all for three hours, but, you know, I, I wonder, like, man, I, I think that, man, we're lacking a little bit of that with the program, with the liturgy, you know? It doesn't have to be so liturgical or programmatic. It's like, you know, if we hear, we just, man, let's go ahead, loop that. Stay there, bro, you know? Yeah. Hi, I have a question. First, thank you all for this really amazing panel and conversation. I wanted to go back to the beginning um, when Camille offered up this beautiful, intimate vignette of kneeling at the altar. And I'm wondering if you can speak to the moment when you kneel at the altar and you might not hear a response from God. How does that show up in your practice? How does it move your practice forward in the music that you create, if um, at all? Yeah. So, um, where that where that quote came from was me talking about my compositional practice and and saying like well you know like how do you um how do you make your work and i was saying a lot of it is just being there you kind of just have to be in the be in the room every day you know if you're in the room sometimes you'll get it sometimes you won't um and and it's the same in 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 my spiritual practice or in in everyone's life it's just like and sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't, and that's fine. Sometimes you won't feel, you know, sometimes you won't feel it, you know? Um, and that's, I, I, that's the ebb and flow. And, and it makes you really grateful for those times where you get it, you know? Um, but I, I also, like, I kind of envision it, at least compositionally, I envision it as me um, sitting down at, at the piano. I write normally at the piano, sitting down at the piano, and I'm kind of just like, grasping at, at air, quite literally, you know, and watching these, the, the gems are up there and I just kind of got to find out how to, how to bring it down, you know, and if I get one, then, then the hard part's over, then, like, then I have a system on how to, like, generate something out of that, but I, the hard part is, like, getting the magic, you know, what, what's, what's making the magic, you know, and then once I get the thing, it's over. Then it's cool. We we have something to work with, you know. Um, 
but I realized that that's like a sacred moment to receive that, you know, because um, it doesn't happen often. And I, often I'll go through months of nil, nothing, you know, zero music being made. Um, and some, and and I also, and this is this goes back to the, to to why I'm kind of urgent about that the archive thing. It's like. Also, you know, sometimes I have a fear that one day I'm just not going to be able to write any good music anymore. Like, I'm, it's just, I'm, the well is just going to run dry. It, I, I don't think it, I don't, realistically, I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, I, there's like an anxiety in me and an urgency to, for that whenever I do have something to like go hard with it. Whenever I get, it, when I, whenever I like have it, then I'm in the moment and I stay there because it's like, I don't know when I'm gonna get that again. I just don't know. And if it never comes, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta have stuff to lean on. I'm not good with commissions. You know, this is something that I realized. I don't. And and if I if I ever get my hands on like, like, you know, billions of dollars, right? I'll start. I, like, I want to start a commission program where like the only stipulation is like you can't make any other work within that year. Like you just. You own, like, only focus on this, don't take any other work. Because I think the reason why commission work is, my commission work at least, is slightly lesser than my personal work is, I spend, like, I, I don't have a timeline. You know, so if, 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 I can, if I can work on it for as long as I want to, yeah, I mean, I'll make the best, the best thing I can possibly make, hopefully. But I, I, I was saying this to say that, like, what it does is it makes me, like, make a lot of stuff um, kind of on the, on the front end so that when I get a commission, I have something to holster just in case. Because I don't want, I want it to be good. I, I need my, if I get a commission, I'm going to put out some, some, something that's hard. You know, I'm not, I'm not finna put out no like rushed thing, you know? And so, it, yeah, it's like, I, I, I don't know. I, I have severe anxiety when it comes to that, you know? Yeah. Recording live and recording in a studio. Um, there are moments when I listen to your music and you sound like two different people. The, the studio recording requires a different thing and in a way the, the boxes and the dividers change the relationship between musicians. Especially because they put a sound box around drummers. Yeah. It, it kind of, it, it requires that another kind of conditioning happens, mm -hmm. but then the live performances, I think, are a different jam. Yep. And, and it's almost like the difference between, uh, I don't know what it is, but it, but it feels like the studio may offer a better quality sound and sound isolation and control, but the live performance does something else. And I just would like you to talk about how you um, how you consider the difference between live recordings and studio per, per recordings? Yep, hundred um, percent. You know, uh, there have been there have been. I was, I'll preface this by saying there there have been a handful of artists artists where I listen to them and it registers to me, like I listen to the records and it registers to me as live, and then I'm like, whoa, this was in the studio. They got to something. You, Train is like that for me. John Coltrane is like that for me. You know, where like, you, you, and you're like, oh, they made that at Rudy Van Gogh? They made that in the studio? Like, it sounds live, you know? It's a, it's a spirit thing, it sound, like it has the spirit of liveness, right? But, um, but yeah, by and large, the, the live recordings are always more killing. Everyone gets to what they need to get to live versus in the studio. And I think, um, man, I, I watch a lot of basketball and I think it, a lot of it has to do with how you handle the pressure. You know, I think about like, these folks in the last like three minutes of the game, five minutes in the game, and um, you know, I just I, like I, I think that's really similar to what it's like to pay two thousand dollars to go in the studio, a highly pressurized situation where you pay this you pay this money to go in the studio for a day, let's say two 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 thousand a day, right? And um, you know, you're, you're forced to make something that is going to exist in perpetuity for the rest of your life. It's like, it's not, it's not really an organic situation to, to create or make good stuff in, you know? Um, 
and there's just a lot of mental work that mental hurdle, hurdles you have to get over to even make noise in, in the studio, you know. So um, I think that's a, a lot of the reason why I prefer live as well. Um, there's also something to be said about, um, you know, maybe comfortability. That's the word, you know, like. Um, if I can put myself in the right mental headspace, if I can, man, I, I do like a, before all of my, or I mean, I only have two records, but before both of my records, I did a month of fasting before recording. You know, a, a part of that was like, man, this is, this is hard work. This is like, this is pressure, you know? So like, I gotta make sure my body's kind of in the right conditions to even do, mentally to do that, you know? Um, yeah, because, I want it to feel live. I want people to like look back on my music in like 50 years, 100 years, and be like, man, I was in the studio, man, and damn, that sound live. You know what I mean? I want, I want that to happen, so um, yeah. And I, and, and I want it to feel boundless in that way. Live, live material always feels like they don't care. There's a certain disrespect to the music that I think is essential, you know? And I, like, I, I talk about this a lot with, man, everyone asks me like, man, like, well, what do you look for in like a side person? What do you look for in like, somebody who's like playing with you, you know, in your band or whatever. And I'm like, I look for them to like kind of disrespect my music. Coming in like, like claim space, like really just like sit up in that thing, you know? Don't, like the, the perfect side person is gonna come in and like fulfill your vision and, and it'll be like, oh yeah, man, he was, yeah, they were good, they were, they were cool. You know, but like a capital A artist is gonna walk in there and like open it up and you're like, okay, I hated that. You know, and, and I want that, you know, I, I, like I want to hate, I want to hate your plan sometimes, you know, I, I want you to like take those sort of disrespectful risks, you know, um, and that's something that really happens in the live, not in the studio. No one, like, we're all trying to like make the perfect take in the studio, subconsciously, you know, and I think that's the work that needs to be done is like, like, let's get out of that, you know, let's just like, let's get down and dirty, like, let's, let's go hard, you know. I don't know, but it's it's tough. The live the live thing is always way way more killing. But then there's always one crucial mistake in the live joints that makes it where I can't use them. I've I got so many live recordings just it's just in my Dropbox, and it's like there's there's always like every song just has one thing that's just too bad. Yeah, exactly. Where it's just like oh man, or like somebody dropped the music or something. It's like oh man, he got lost. This was going so well, man, <laughs> like that. <laughs> Always one crucial mistake. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely, I'm definitely air. The breath is, I mean, the element. Um, but yeah, I think all the elements really. I mean, I I think of um, man, I. Like, Earth is a, is a big one for me. Like, just the, the where my feet are. I'm I'm a very still sort of player, you know. Um, almost to a fault, I'm a little boring to watch because I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm kind of like really just kind of standing super still. Um, and I I think there's something about that maybe orient to the to the ground, you know, that I think is um, maybe. It helps me create better. It helps me think more. You know, um, slows things down for me. You know, I um, also ha have a uh, I have a fear of losing my breath. You know, and so um, yeah, breath is something that even in my subconscious has always been like held sacred to me. It's something I think about a lot: air, breath. Um, I'm also in love with the immaterial, you know, in that kind of breath really kind of represents that in a lot of ways for me, air. Um, in that, in, in the video we did with Colleen Smith for the record, um, we were talking about like visual manifestations of spirit, you know, or spirit moving, and we both kind of came, came upon maybe air as being, you know, air and water as being too real, um, I mean, yeah, water's probably one of the 
most profound ones for me, just in, for a lot of reasons. You know, I think water carries a lot of power. But air is another one that kind of feels that way for me. It feels like spirit in a lot of ways. Yeah, they all work together totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so all of them. Then you're right, all of them. <laughs> yeah. I think we're going to wrap it so you can get to sound check. Thank you. But I, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. And I hope to see you at Constellation very soon. Thank you all.